Commission for Wednesday, August 28th. If we could rise. please. Chair Clark, Here. Vice Chair McGill, Here. Commissioner Baker, Commissioner Lesnar, excuse me, Commissioner Lesnar Buxton, Commissioner Longstreet, Here. Commissioner Martinez Cohen, Here. Commissioner Perry. Yes. Do we have any changes to the agenda? Nope. Okay. Uh, written communications? Nope. Uh, we've come to public comment. Any member of the public may address the commission for up to two minutes on a subject within the jurisdiction of the commission that is not scheduled for a public discussion before the commission. So if you're gonna speak on something on the agenda, that will come later. The total amount of time for public comments will be 15 minutes. It looks like we have one person, a Mr. Don Leffler. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to come and thank you for the commission and the city for the new dog park at McKenzie Park. Mm -hmm. I've taken my dog there probably 15 or 20 times since it's opened and it's just a terrific facility and I wanted to thank you. I would make one note about a design issue. Um, there are all of the seating is right next to the gates. And that means that a lot of dogs crowd around the people who are sitting there at the benches. And it sometimes is a little difficult to get, there's congestion going in and out. So I would just suggest consideration perhaps of some seating a little bit, of, excuse me, a little bit away from the gates. But other than that, we just love it. Thank you. Thank you for speaking. I, I remember you from one yes. time I was yes, there. I met you there. Yeah. One of the first nights. Yeah. yeah. Thank you for your input. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Youth Council report. Chair Clark, we have Quinn Stefan giving the report. And I would also note that Isis Castaneda, who's our new Youth Council coordinator, is in the audience and she's transitioning well into her role. Thank you. Good afternoon, members of the Parks and Recreation Commission. My name is Quinn Steffen, and I'm the current chair of the Santa Barbara Youth Council. The Youth Council is just starting its new year, but we are hitting the ground running. At the end of July, I had the incredible opportunity to go with the mayor and Marco, one of the other members of the Youth Council, to the inaugural Mayor's National Youth Summit in Los Angeles. At the summit, there was representation from around 30 cities from across the country, mayors and youth. The discussions at the summit were building effective youth councils, creating a culture of service, um, organizing town halls and fostering youth voter engagement. With the topic of building youth councils, it was interesting to see that the youth councils of other cities often do not look like ours in Santa Barbara. However, there was still much to be learned from the other councils and committees. Mayor Murillo and I were on the panel for the discussion on the youth town halls because the Santa Barbara Youth Council has a long history with town halls or speakouts, especially the youth candidates forums. I personally went to the breakout session discussing these town halls and came out with a set of recommendations to be able to create the best event possible. But what really made the summit special to me was the people. With every person's addition to the group conversation, you could see and hear part of their story about why involvement in local government or activism is important to them, including the youth who feel it is time for us to have a voice and the mayors who are largely supportive of that fact. I'm extremely thankful to be given that opportunity, and I know it will be beneficial to the Youth Council. So, we, as the Youth Council, we currently have open recruitment for five vacancy spots, and the deadline applications are on September 24th. This year, we have four new members, seven returning members, and three new junior high members with two spots available for junior high. Um, coming up on September 6th and 7th, we have a leadership training, and although we have only had one meeting this year so far, with the new and returning members, I believe it will be a really successful year, and I'm looking forward to working with all of the Youth Council and our new staff ad advisor, Isis Castaneda. Thank you. Thank you, that was wonderful and informative. And good luck with the coming year. Thank you. Um, uh, commission and staff communications, do we have any? All right, let me put these on, this would help. <laughs> <laughs> Commissioner Committee Assignment Reports, thank you. I'll start with okay. Vice Chair McGill. 
Um, <laughs> um, so I did attend the Park Foundation meeting um, last week, actually, and we um, spent time reviewing financials, the pavilion update, and continued the conversation around um, stepping up and, and ideas for funding requests going forward. Um, I also attended and spoke at both of the city council meetings where the park opening hour, et cetera, ordinance was discussed and, and actioned. Thank you. Commissioner Perry? First, I'd like to apologize for missing our last commission meeting. July was a busy month. Um, was not able to attend arts and crafts last week, but I did visit the show a few weeks ago and visited with a member of the vendors and just would like to share so, uh, two of their concerns. One was they would like to see a strengthening in their monitors, the, the, the show monitors, and would like to see a, an accounting for their advertising budget for the past couple of years. Hopefully that can be provided. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yes, the Creeks uh, Advisory Committee had a um, site visit yes, uh, last week on the 21st at the Royal Borough Restoration at Hidden Valley. They visited uh, that project and also discussed the upcoming Royal Borough project at Palermo Drive. Um, unfortunately, I was not able to attend, but I know that they usually post all the information that they speak about on their on the website. So I would encourage people to check it out if they want to see it, that or know more about it. Thank you, Commissioner Longstreet. Um, I attended both city council meetings on the 6th and the 13th regarding the ordinance changes. I did not speak on the 6th. I thought the uh, action was clear to happen and uh, Ms. McGill did a great job. I did speak on the 13th because I was slightly dismayed on the action going forward. So. Um, those are my opinions. And also spoke in support of the Gwendolyn Strong Foundation Agreement. Um, I think it, it's so wonderful that the city's gonna be able to move forward with that foundation and achieve an all abilities playground. Um, and the NAC meeting this month was canceled. Thank you. I also attended the Park Foundation meeting this month and the Street Tree Advisory Committee meeting where we, the city arborist, visited all the trees that we'll be talking about on the agenda later today. Um, with that, can we move on to employee recognition? Chair Clark and Commissioners, uh, one of our employees, Spencer Frazier, who is a grounds worker too, is recognized for five years of service. Uh, Spencer's done a lot of different things in our park system. He's one of the employees that we have that start as hourly uh, part-time and then compete to become a permanent staff member and he's gone from a one position to a two position. So um, we're very fortunate to have him. I think, is this the Spencer that I always see at trail work days, pitching in and clearing our trails? Chair Clark, that's correct. Ah, well, if you're watching this, we really appreciate the work you've done on our trails. It's great. Um, the summary of council actions. This is for information. Did anybody have any questions? Nope. Okay, moving on to the minutes. We've all had a chance to read them. Would anyone like to make a motion to waive the reading and approve them? Motion um, to approve. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Any discussion? So moved. Um, that brings us to the Street Tree Advisory Committee items. Chair Clark and Commissioners, the first item on the Street Tree uh, Advisory Committee agenda is the uh, 320 Paseo del Descanso. Uh, Black Acacia is on the side of the property along what is called Paradise Road. The uh, right of way at this location ends at the fence that you can see here in the picture. So it's really a narrow right of way on that side. Um, the tree is in decline and um, it, it tends to lean over the, the curb way there, pushing down on the curb, disturbing the fence. Um, the committee felt that uh, this 
trees served its useful life and that uh, it's time for uh, it to go. So their recommendation is to approve the removal of this tree on the condition that a street tree is placed along the front of the property. Um, the, the currently designated tree for the front of the property is black acacia, but there are high voltage wires there and the tree won't do well under the high voltage wires. So the committee's asked to place the uh, tr street tree designation for this block on a future agenda. So you'll see that coming forward at some point. Uh, again, their recommendation is to approve the removal on the condition they plant a designated street tree along the front of the property. I have a question. Um, that house, there isn't much front yard. It, it seemed to be very shallow. Is there room for a, a tree in that area with the wires and the narrowness of that front yard? Chair Clark, Commissioner Longstreet, the right of way in the front uh, is wide enough and it's open so the rooting wouldn't be as constricted as it is on the side of the property. Um, but there is road right away that extends beyond the curb and there is room for street trees there. The committee's desire is to select a tree that can uh, exist below those high voltage wires. Thank you. If there are no other questions, we have a speaker on the topic, uh, Mr. Jed Miller. Welcome. Um, well, I'm in favor of the recommendation. Oh, thank you all for this opportunity. And I'm in favor of the recommendation. I've, I deal with the property. It's my family property. And as, as well as when the wind blows and it's so close to the house, as well as worrying about something breaking off and hitting the house, I have to deal with the roots going underneath the foundation and the roots getting into the, the lateral sewer line. So periodic maintenance is, is required for that. Um, that's just about all I have to say other than thank you all for this time. Does anyone have any questions? Just one quick question. Um, in terms of going forward with the recommendation, the, I guess what you're suggesting is that the the variety of street tree is to be determined. Do we need to s do anything with that or can we just approve it as written? Uh, Chair Clark and Commissioner McGill, the recommendation coming from the committee is to approve on the condition a designated street tree be planted. Um, at the time that they pull permits to remove the tree, whatever tree is designated at that time would need to be planted. We anticipate this to be a pretty quick turnaround and they can achieve the planting within the 60 day uh, permit window. Um, I'll make a motion to uh, concur with the Street Trade Advisory Committee committee and um, approve the removal on the condition that it is replaced with one of the designated street trees. Second. Chair Clark and Commissioners, the next item on your agenda is 2414 Santa Barbara Street. The applicant is requesting to remove um, the uh, magnolia in the foreground in this photograph and the two Chinese elms that are in the background of this photograph. The uh, magnolia is in pretty severe decline and um, the elm trees are, uh, are in an area that they're planning to redevelop in the front yard. Um, they're planning to uh, change grades to reduce the front wall to current city requirements, currently higher than city uh, uh, requirements allow. So they're going to reduce the grade, uh, install a, a, a stair entrance along the front of the property and a walkway up to the property up there. Um, their, their request is to remove all three trees on the condition that, uh, or, or they're proposing to replace the trees with, with uh, Coast Live Oaks, uh, which is consistent with other trees in the area and the street trees, in fact. Um, the committee uh, felt that the condition of the magnolia tree war warranted removal and replacement. 
and the uh, the tree closest to the driveway uh, also warranted removal. Uh, committee felt that uh, by leaving one tree, the co community wouldn't have as big of immediate impact and the project could still um, essentially complete all of the design features that they are proposing. So the committee recommends that the magnolia and the um, Chinese elm farthest to the east be approved for removal and the Chinese elm farthest to the west be denied. Question? Yeah. No. Um, so when I walked up there, um, I, I took a good look at the tree that is being recommended for denial. I'm going to read through the package, of course. Um, I noticed that the one that's being recommended for denial, there's quite a bit of branch sort of entangled with and overhanging the, um, the wires on the street, the, the phone wires. Um, how much of an issue is that? I guess that's my, that's my question. I mean, is there, is there really kind of a hazard there that is not, you know, that could be removed um, by removing the tree? And then I guess just sort of, I don't know, this is sort of a, a, a wondering. It's just, I, what, the re, what they are proposing in terms of the coast live oaks kind of makes sense aesthetically. It makes sense with the street. Um, and I could see why they would choose to, you know, why they would want to do that. And I'm, I'm not, I wasn't sure what the overriding concern was with leaving that tree there given the potential issues and given what they're pr actually proposing. Chair Clark and Commissioner McGill, the, um, for a little background, the utility companies are mandated by the California Public Utilities Commission to maintain the safety of their lines. Southern California Edison does that by physically pruning the trees away from the lines to maintain the safety. The other lines are lower voltage and the tr lines are protected by design features to allow them to be within trees. Um, if a branch should fall, typically what happens when a branch falls on a wire, it bounces off the wire and falls clear in most cases. Well, the design features allow f to give flex in the lines so that the lines don't snap when they're hit, rather they allow for that bouncing. So these lower voltage wires are a non-issue in relation to the tree. Certainly pruning could be done uh, to, to mitigate some of that. The committee just felt that that third tree had the best canopy out of the three trees and removal of three trees in one spot was quite a bit. So their desire was to at least preserve that one tree for a while longer. Um, the committee concurred with your assessment about the replacement trees, that they're very fitting with the, the area. Uh, and appreciated that, uh, that offer for that replacement, um, but they just felt that the removal of three trees was a bit much for this one area and wanted to try and preserve one tree for a while. I think also in, in answer to your question, you're thinking why not take them all out at once and put these nice coast live oaks in? Yeah. And you have to remember that a mature tree gives something different to our urban forest and community than a young tree. So they're trying to phase it in and mitigate the abrupt impact. Yeah, and sort of my, when looking at it, it seemed like uh, it's actually a fairly mature area. So that's, yeah, it's, I guess it's where's your aesthetics. <laughs> yeah. Um, are there any other questions of Mr. Downey? If not, we've got two speakers on this item. Uh, Ida Kane. Hi, Madam Chair, Commissioners. My name is Nicole Horn. I also submitted a speaker slip. Is it all right if I speak before Ms. Kane? Yeah. And she can give you her two minutes, so you have four total. If, oh, is that no, what we both wanted to speak. Okay. I'm just the landscape architect. She's the homeowner. I thought I would lay yes. out the rationale first. Please. If, if that's all right. My, again, my name is Nicole Horn. I'm a landscape architect, and we've uh, been hired by the Canes to prepare the landscape plan for this project. As Mr. Downey mentioned, they are proposing to lower and remove portions of the wall, but that is primarily because of the visibility into that driveway. You can see how that's high on both sides. So we would be 
um, pushing those walls back and removing portions and lowering portions so that we have better access and visibility for both the homeowners, their guests, and the neighborhood. Um, and I just wanted to make a couple points here about the health of that tree that's in question. Of course, we would ask you to consider removal of all three trees, um, different from what stack has recommended. But that third tree in particular, we had an arborist go out there in November of last year that was submitted as part of our application. And he specifically said that that tree is clearly in decline as indicated by the dieback in the crown and the extremely small leaves. And there were, at the time, um, about two years ago, there was a third tree. There was a third elm in between those other two. And I think that's also mentioned in his report that that caused the one that's most visible there to sort of grow really oddly. And that tree died two years ago. So that I'm bringing that up now to sort of make the case that these trees really are in poor health. They've been in a drought for several years. And we're proposing the three oak trees as part of a future contribution to the urban forest. I understand that there would be an immediate loss, but really that loss is not um, potentially very far <laughs> from now if we were to do nothing. And I wanted to also point out that this project was reviewed by the Single Family Design Review Board three times um, where we presented the landscape plan. I initially presented different options for the tree species. Um, if they would consider something maybe less grand or that would provide less shade and a more open canopy similar to the elm, like a acacia stenophylla. And they felt very strongly that um, the proposed oaks were really in keeping with the neighborhood and would provide that biomass and shade and neighborhood character consistent with the neighboring properties. So I just wanted to mention that they are in support of what we had initially proposed with the three trees. And then lastly, I just wanted um, to point out that, you know, when we're regrading this area for to do the walls, that will have some impact on the tree roots. So if that tree were to remain, and as Mr. Spiak pointed out in his arborist letter, there would be impacts to that existing tree root system, and that could potentially cause or, you know, hasten <laughs> the decline of that tree. Thank you. Thank you. I have, a quest yes. I have a question for the landscape architect. Um, can you just give me a brief explanation on the regrading of the front yard? Where, how much lower that wall is going to go and just a little bit. Yes, of course. And I also forgot to mention, I did bring a photo simulation of what that would look like um, that we had prepared for single family and then the existing condition so I can pass the, yeah, that would help. Yeah, that would help. Yeah. And then if you're looking at the photo right here to the right, those stone walls are the property um, that we're talking about, and then that white brick wall is the neighboring property. And you can see that white brick wall is not actually retaining anything. So on that side of the driveway, all, that entire wall would be gone and it would be totally flat. And then on the left side, we're pushing that back three or four feet, I don't remember exactly, and it would, it would be a two-foot wall on the left. So we'd be retaining the two-foot wall um, as you go north on Santa Barbara Street and then matching up where that telephone pole is approximately is the neighbor's wall, which you can see is slightly lower than ours. So we were proposing to step up at that just to match that existing height um, in the wall there. And that would be, if you're looking at the photo simulations, there's, this, there's another set of steps planned sort of midway in between where those two existing trees are. Thank you, that helps. Hi, um, my name's Ida Kane. I'm one of the homeowners. We've owned the house now for a little bit over three years. And when we bought the house, we started with a, a big backyard project and um, expect our, the prior owner of the house lived there for 103 years. And so, or lived there until she was 103 years old, I should say. And we really um, expect this to be our forever house. And so we started, um, kind of renovating the backyard, planted a lot of beautiful olive trees that provide additional shade to the neighborhood. The backyard was in an equal state of disrepair and kind of overgrown. And we really would love to finish the front yard also to have trees that have a full life uh, going forward as 
to, to complement the backyard as well. So I guess I just wanted to say that although I appreciate um, all of the work that has gone into evaluating it, I would request that you consider approving the removal of all of the trees that we have requested and then the replanting of the trees that we believe would add life to the house, would provide shade, um, especially over time, and would be there for the duration. So that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. I have a question. Is it how far along in the um, permitting process is this project? Is this the last step or has it been just is it the last step? Chair Clark and Commissioner Longstreet, I'll, I'll let the owner yeah. answer that question. <laughs> yeah, so building has approved our plans. Uh -huh. um, this is definitely waiting. We're waiting on this. Um, uh, there, uh, there's desk comments. I'm kind of forgetting the six different areas. Um, there's like over-the-counter comments for one of them. Sewer Public Works is, uh, we just resubmitted something because they said we had to replace the sewer lateral, so we just resubmitted that. So we're getting, we're getting really close to the end here, but yes, building but has you're already done, approved. You're done with the design review boards and all oh, of that, that aspect? Yes. Okay. We, we've been thank through you. rounds of permitting already. Okay, thank yeah. you. I had a question of Mr. Downey. Um, can you make any comments on the health or uh, the state of decline of the tree we're proposing to maintain? Um, Chair Clark and Commissioners, the, uh, the committee felt that the condition of the tree that the, the committee would like to preserve uh, has improved since the arborist report. The, the foliage looks lusher than is stated in the report and the canopy is, is, is filled in quite nicely. Um, I will note that the applicant is proposing to replace with 48 inch box size oaks, so they would be pretty substantial trees. Um, so uh, the committee really felt that, although the Arborist Report was important information, that uh, it was a little dated and the tree has since recovered some from his report. Having trouble visual. Oh, sorry. Quite fun. Trouble sorry. visualizing a 48-inch box. How long would it take a tree to, of that size, to achieve the size of uh, the tree? That's. Uh, Chair Clark and Commissioners, uh, the 48-inch box re uh, relates to the size of the container at the time of planting. Um, it gives a little more immediate effect. It's probably going to be about. 15 feet tall with a 10 foot spread ish uh, and um, the the problem with planting larger trees is first you get a, a an immediate effect but the tree goes into somewhat of a dormancy and stays stagnant before it grows for a longer period of time than if you plant a smaller tree there's been research done by universities on the size of trees at planting and their growth rates. And in every case, whatever the smaller size tree was, it established quicker and outgrew the next bigger size tree um, in, before the next bigger size tree began to grow. So planting smaller gets you bigger trees sooner, but planting bigger trees gives you more of an immediate effect. Thank you. Um, are you able to make any comments about if we, if that one tree was to stay, how it would be impacted by the plans? Looking at the drawings that they've submitted as part of the package, it does look like a pretty extensive excavation project. If you know, there's going to be leveling and and um, stairs going in. I would imagine that that would be pretty detrimental to the tree in question. But I just curious what you, what you, what you think of that. Chair Clark and uh, Commissioner Cohen, the, um, for an example, I would call out the Morton Bay fig tree. Many of those roots are above ground. You can see the roots extend for quite a ways above ground. Um, it, they could still achieve their grading most likely with minimal root pruning. Um, just some of the roots would, would have more exposure. Um, also, uh, we can make staff available to provide advice about that root pruning if it, if it was necessary. Are there any more questions? 
So I'm going to be a little probably contrarian. Um, on balance, hearing everything, I just kind of think what the homeowners are proposing makes sense. So I would like to make a motion that we actually approve the um, app homeowner's application as written for the removal of the three trees and replacement with coast, at, coast oaks, which I will. I'll second it. Did you want to add findings? And I would just stick with the findings that were there that pursuant to SBMC 152490, the commission finds that it is a reasonable and practical development of the property on which the trees are located. I second that. Um, for discussion, um, I completely understand where you're coming from. I'm not going to agree with you because I believe that in this day and age, every tree that we have counts, and I think the matured canopy counts, and if we start making one exception, and all the homeowners down State Street decide to redo their front yards, then we're going to be losing a lot of canopy. Um, but I respect your decision. If there's no more discussion, uh, we can take a vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Nay. So moved. Chair Clark and commissioners, the next item on the agenda is 233 Kai Manzanita. It, uh, there's a mature silver uh, maple in the front yard. Um, the the uh, applicant's uh, arborist is recommending that at this time it's time to remove the tree. Um, the tree has hollows, um, evidence of decay organisms. Um, it, at one point the tree was cabled to try and protect it. Um, and the, uh, the structure of the tree, there's, there's three major branches coming from one location and they're really crowding themselves out. The committee reviewed these items. Um, they, didn't, uh, they didn't think that there was any imminent danger for this tree and uh, felt that the tree could be preserved for the uh, community a while longer. Um, however, uh, since the applicant is working with an arborist, um, they would like to see more information about the uh, degree of concerns for the tree. Um, so their recommendation is to deny without prejudice, to allow the property owner to get more information from the arborist about uh, the severity of the, uh, the issues with the tree and uh, the likelihood that uh, the tree is uh, in a condition where its uh, risk is higher than uh, what the committee is feeling. So uh, again, their recommendation is to deny without prejudice to allow an opportunity to provide m more arborist information. I have a question. For your question, did, could, could you just explain briefly what deny without prejudice is for people in the audience? Chair Long, uh, Clark and Commissioners, the uh, without prejudice means that he can provide that additional requested information um, and does not have to submit a new application. He would be going off the same application. Thank you. Commissioner Longstreet? Uh, are you saying that we need, uh, the committee was looking at over and above the Beaver Company Inc. report letter that we have? What? What more did the committee want? Chair Clark and Commissioner Longstreet, the, uh, the arborist report notes defects in the tree, but it doesn't go to the effect of how much impact that has on the safety of the tree. They're looking to get more quantification on, on how these, or uh, the arborist opinion on how these are impacting the tree and whether that is something that is imminent or something that could preserve the tree a while. So they want a more, dis, a more uh, definitive statement than, in my opinion, the tree is becoming more of a liability than it is beneficial to the circumstances? Um, Chair Clark and Commissioner Longstreet, um, every tree presents some liability. Right. And, and uh, the committee just wants to make sure that the evidence in the tree points to the fact that it's time now rather than a year down the road or so it, it, the community could benefit from this canopy longer if 
if the tree is not in imminent danger of breaking apart. Thank you. Um, I have one question. Um, based on this report, so it does cite some structural problems. Um, is there a cable that is holding the tree up at this point? Is that something about? Yes, there is. Oh. The, the cable goes from one branch to another to hold the branches together so that the, the, the connection point down at the bottom doesn't split apart as easily. It's a, a mechanical uh, support uh, beyond what the tree normally does to support. Okay. It, it looks pretty good for having been through all this fungus and these structural problems. Um, I sort of echo what BB says, though. I don't know what I don't know what more the what more the what more the committee's looking for as far as the danger. I guess if the cable stays there, it won't. It's not going to fall over. Fall over. Fall over is different than a branch coming down. Well, I feel like if the branches come down, the likelihood that all of it will come down is a lot more probable, at least in yeah. the experience I had. One tr one branch of my tree fell down and the whole tree <laughs> was about to come down. I, I guess when um, the street tree advisory committee went out there, did they did they notice dieback in the ground? Did they notice structural imp impact? I don't know, impacted bark is, impacted bark. Did, did they see, visually see those things? And if so, what's the correlation between dieback in the crown and impacted bark and failure of the tree? Chair Clark, Commissioners, the, um, the, there is ever very slight dieback apparent in the crown. Um, the defects that are present, again, um, are the attachment of the bra main branches at the bottom. They're crowding each other out. As time goes, as the branches get bigger, they start pushing on each other. Um, and that pushing uh, aids the fact that there isn't as good a connection in between the branches, um, which is called included bark. Um, that included bark with the pushing on the branches from each other as they get bigger, eventually will cause branches to fail. The committee felt that based on the evidence of the tree, they're, they're not pushing each, on each other that much yet. But if you add the fact that there's evidence that there's decay and decay organisms in the tree, the committee was unable to determine the extent of that decay. And uh, they wanted more information about, from the arborist's opinion, about how far that decay extended and how the um, other structural defects uh, play into that. So uh, arborists could go back out there and does, do they take samples to see how far the fungus goes? Is, is that how it would work? Chair Clark and Commissioners, I, I have offered to work with, uh, I spoke to the applicant today and offered to work with their arborists to, to uh, explain to them the, the type of information that would be valuable to the committee. Um, but there are many methods to check extent of decay. Um, some are very invasive, some are very in invasive, and it's really up to the individual arborist to determine how they want to do that. One simple method is to take a wooden mallet and you tap on the, uh, the trunk around and you listen for changes in the sound that allows you to assess how much decay is inside. It's not as exact as the other methods, which would be drilling into the tree and finding how much strong wood there is before the hollow wood goes in. That is more invasive and can cause the decay to spread. Um, there's also electronic equipment where they uh, do sonograms of trees and where they do electrocardiograph uh, representations of trees. Though, uh, I don't think that those would be warranted in this case. They're just really looking for some kind of definitive statement as the uh, as to the extent of the decay in the inside. So uh, you made a comment about, well, maybe the neighborhood could enjoy the canopy for a while longer, and you said a year or so, which, which triggers a question. Given this kind of tree disease, um, in your experience, when, when a tree is infected like this, is it, A, 
definite that it's really on the way out? And, and are we talking one year potential, viable life, five year, 10 year, do you have any way of knowing? Because I think it makes a difference in whether you approve an application now or you wait. Chair Clark and Commissioner McGill, um, if this tree were, um, well, the, the problem with educated guesses is their guesses. Um, I would say that if there were much more dieback in this tree than there was, and it was showing uh, small normal knee leaves or, or other signs than that, it would be a much stronger indicator for the, the committee. Um, the assessment that they're recommending uh, the applicant do would provide that better information about the extent of the decay. There are trees that have very extensive decay and fall over without any warning and no signs. But there are trees in this condition that stand for 15 years. So, so uh, really, if, if the tree is starting to decline um, that rapidly, a year's time is relatively short in a tree's life. Um, this tree's probably 60, 70 years old at least. Um, so a year's time is, is a small length of time in a tree's life, but over a year's time, you can see changes in the tree that can be documented. You've got a picture of the tree today. You can submit another picture of the tree in a year and show the change in the tree, which is another indicator of how rapidly the disease is moving. Um, so, so the committee's recommendation allows for them to give us more information. Um, and if that information still isn't enough to, uh, make, uh, to have them make a recommendation for approval, a year's time is not necessarily unreasonable time to look at if there's change. So then I have one quick follow-up kind of procedural question. The deny without prejudice, does that kind of live in perpetuity? So if it was waiting for a year to see what's happening with the tree, would that st still exist under that same denial without prejudice? Uh, Chair Clark and Commissioner McGill, um, we would have to check with the city attorney's office on that length of time, um, but typically this is something, uh, given the desire of the applicant to remove the tree for safety reasons, that they would move on fairly quickly. Chair Clark and, and Commissioner McGill, I, I would also add, as you have seen at times in your experience as commissioners, um, circumstances change and depending on how close that change is to when an application's um, been reviewed and considered, you know, we err on the side of wanting to work with residents and, and facilitate whatever next step they need to take. Clearly, uh, the city values the urban forest, which does include some private trees. At the same time, as Mr. Downey indicated with his um, suggestion that he would work with, with the company to help evaluate um, the condition of the tree. We, we do, to the best of our ability, support ev those evaluations and the best determination possible. So it's, it's hard to know what the applicant would, which way the applicant would go without asking them. Thanks. May I, Chair, speak? Yeah. Mm -hmm. What I'm hearing is we are basically asking our applicant to sit for a year and monitor the tree and see if there's any further decay. I don't think we're there yet. I ha we haven't even heard from the applicant yet. So I think okay, I'm, yeah. I'm asking about the street trees, uh, street tree committee. Chair Clark, Commissioner Perry, the, the committee's recommendation is to deny without prejudice to allow them to provide that information as soon as they can get it. If they decide to move forward with the additional arborist information, it would come back to the committee much quicker than a year. Without having to refile, that's, that's a very reasonable position. That's correct. Yes. Um, so if there's no other questions, I would like to invite Ms. Rohrbach to speak. Oh, Jan, Mr., sorry. Commissioners, thank you very much for allowing me to speak. Um, 
I thought I was uh, doing the responsible thing. The tree was in pretty good health until this drought hit us. And then all of a sudden it started uh, showing all these this weird growth and everything on the trees and, and it was going sideways pretty fast. So I've got some concerned neighbors. You can see their Lexus parking there all the time. We've lost branches before and that's why I had uh, the tree cabled up because it was getting weak by itself. Uh, we plan on doing some remodeling in the, not remodeling, but landscaping in the front. I didn't want to spend the money doing all that and then having to come back and have to take the tree out and get to do it twice. I don't have that resources to do that. So I just want to do it one time. And I thought this is a, an advantage time to do it. If it's, it's looked like it's going south, now's the time to pull it out and then we can move ahead. That's what I wanted to do. Thank you. Thank you. Chair Clark and Commissioners, I would add that the applicant is proposing a replacement tree. Um, he suggested a couple species and staff would be happy to work with him on selection of species if the commission voted to approve removal with a condition. Would anyone like to discuss this further or make a motion? I guess I'd like to ask the applicant um, about their willingness to work with staff to reassess just to get your arborist out there again. Come on up. Get your arborist out there again and give us a little bit more definitive answer before we pull that tree. Um, when I, I've, I've spoke to the arborist and he's, he's willing to come out again. He's, he, they trim it about every two years. That's why it doesn't have a lot of dieback because I've been keeping it small and thinned out. So it's, uh, no, he's willing to come out and give us okay. some more, more paperwork. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and just, you know, just to follow me, I think one of the things that maybe we're all struggling with, I'm struggling with when I read that letter, is just like, well, there's just not much meat in that letter, mm -hmm. so it's really hard to have anything to go on. And that, that's what I've str I'm struggling with, so. Well, I know we're I'm really gonna miss that tree. I mean, it's got two swings on it, and got Halloween coming up with all the uh, dead leaves are gonna be for that, and uh, we've, I planted it 40 years ago, so it's, uh, it's been with us a long time. So, thank you. Thank you. Um, well, then I would make a motion to concur with the Street Tree Advisory Commission, Committee to deny without prejudice and to um, ask staff to work with the homeowner for um, the removal. Uh, now, I have a question on that. Can we put this in staff's hands that if you get what you need from the arborist that you can just move forward with the removal? Chair uh, Clark and Commissioner Longstreet, um, there are exemptions in the municipal code that um, if an arborist can make a case that the tree is uh, in a condition that it's an imminent danger to persons or property, in that situation applicable to this, um, if, if they, they're uh, case rises to the gr degree that is allowable in the municipal code, staff can make an administrative decision. Um, if it doesn't rise to that level, then it would be submitted back to uh, stack and eventually commission for review. Um, so uh, there is those provisions. Um, those include whether if the tree is less than four inches diameter at, uh, diameter at breast height, if the tree's dead, if the tree is uh, infected with the disease that's going to kill other trees, uh, trees in a in a condition where it's going to fall apart, those those kinds of things. Um, if they provide the proper documentation to prove that, then staff can concur with that and approve the removal. Okay, so I would propose that it go back through staff to see. So recognizing there's a motion on the table. Um, is this an appropriate circumstance for actually saying we just want to send it back to staff and not not take an action at all at this meeting? I think that would be denying the removal without prejudice. Well, there's yeah. been a couple instances where we just sent them sent them away to come back. Sure. Sure. Clark Clark and, com and commissioners, um, you know our our most transparent process is to go through the one that's recommended by the Street Tree Advisory Committee. 
the commission can take another action this evening if it chooses and and approve the removal on the condition that it is determined that the tree is decayed to a point where it is it meets those standards. Uh, I think just from the staff standpoint, we err on the side of following what's um, outlined in the municipal code. However, it's at your discretion. Okay, well, let's just have it follow the, the pattern. I think that would be the best. And um, I was gonna second yeah. your motion. Okay. Second. Aye. Chair Clark and Commissioners, the next item on your agenda is 1532 West Valerio Street. This is an Aleppo pine tree <clears throat> that is in the front setback for the property. Um, the applicant is concerned about the amount of damage it's causing. Um, many years ago, there was a clogging of the sewer line. The sewer line's been replaced since. Um, it is lifting the street um, and uh, the wall, the adjacent wall. Um, there was, uh, it was reported to have called, caused difficulties in replacing the water main line in the street. Um, the, there was concern raised that the tree goes through the, the lower wires there um, and that plants don't grow underneath uh, the tree because it is uh, so messy. Um, the committee evaluated the tree, um, determined that each of those concerns can be addressed through maintenance uh, of the tree. Um, the, as I mentioned before, the lo lower wires are designed to be within the trees. Um, the tree could be pruned back from the patio and the wires. Um, the uh, repairs can be made to adjacent structures and root pruning could occur uh, while still retaining the tree. So the committee recommends that the commission deny the removal. And those would be um maintenance that would be done by the city since it's a street tree, right? Chair Clark and Commissioner Longstreet, this is a setback tree. It's a private tree. It would be done by the private property owner. Um, the uh, location does not have a public sidewalk. So in this situation, the tree would have to be within six feet of the built roadway to be a city tree. It is farther back than that. Well, it looks like the street tree advisory committee didn't find any findings for removal, which is why they made the recommendation to deny. They said that the sewer line had already been addressed. They saw plant growth underneath. Pruning was possible. I, I believe if you can't make a finding for removal, you don't remove the tree. Actually, it looks like pruning almost has been happening because went back in there. I didn't, uh, I didn't personally see any signs that, that lines were being impinged on. Um, so, I, mean, yeah, I mean, there's touching, but not weighing down. Yeah, is it correct that they did already fix the sewer problem? I see photos here that they were under some sort of construction. So that problem has been fixed. Chair Clark, Commissioner Cohen, in their letter, they state that they had uh, rectified that situation when that occurred. Got it. Motion? Yes. I move that we concur with the Street Tree Advisory Committee for denial of the removal of a setback tree at 1532 West Valerio. All second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? So moved. Chair Clark and Commissioners, uh, the city recently resumed planting trees this fiscal year, last fiscal year, excuse me. And uh, so in reaching out to different communities that, where trees were uh, uh, planted, the, uh, the, uh, uh, one of the people we sent letters to that we were interested in planting trees um, felt that they didn't care for the tree that's designated there in the 1200 block of Del Oro Avenue. The designated tree is the uh, Kijibut tree in this photo. Um, there are none existing within this block uh, currently. 
Um, it is more suited to inland uh, areas than uh, this. Well, this this tree, the street is almost directly across from Shoreline Park, um, and this is so very coastal. Uh, when we find this tree in coastal areas, it it tends to get muted by the winds and and salts. Um, the committee uh, noted that there are some magnolias in that block. Um, the parkway is too small for a uh, full-size magnolia, um, but they felt that the magnolias were doing well, and a smaller variety uh, would be suitable and consistent with the neighborhood. Their recommendation is to co-designate uh, Magnolia Little Gem and Magnolia St. Mary's varieties of Magnolia. These are smaller varieties than the Magnolia Grandiflora itself and would be suitable for that size parkway. So their recommendation is to co-designate Little Gem Magnolia and St. Mary's Magnolia for uh, the 1200 block of Del Oro. Questions? Motion? I will move that we co-designate the Magnolia Grandiflora and Magnolia, uh, Little Gem and Magnolia Grandiflora St. Mary um, as street trees for the 1200 block of Deloro Avenue. Second. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? So moved. Chair Clark and Commissioners, in the zero block of Anacapa Street just off uh, Shoreline Drive, um, there is a project going in um, that uh, will be developing one of the parcels. Um, the uh, One of the Street Tree Advisory Committee members noted that there are um, king palms along that street, and there are also um, uh, magnolias again uh, along the street um, and he felt that uh, that the uh, area needed more canopy than currently exists um, and that uh, uh, adding a designated species uh, with a canopy tree to the designation of king palm would be beneficial to the area by providing some canopy the committee again felt that it still should be the smaller varieties of trees and given other magnolias on that street they're again recommending co-designation of little jim magnolia and saint mary's magnolia uh, in addition to the uh, king palm for the zero hundred block of anacapa street i move that we co-designate the um, Magnolia Little Gem and the St. Mary Magnolia for the zero block of Anacapa Street. There's no discussion. We can take a vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? So moved. That brings us to a street tree master plan discussion. Chair Clark and commissioners, um, we have some new commissioners and almost every month you've been doing street tree designations. We spent a lot of time a number of years ago uh, providing the commission with a lot of the background and history of the urban forest, different guidance documents that we have that give us guidance to present to you and also the Street Tree Advisory Committee as well as to manage the trees in our care. And um, given that there continue to be more master plan questions and changes and anticipating that in the near future, uh, there will be more work to look at certain corridors in the city for roadway and sidewalk improvements, uh, particularly in areas where we have large trees like Milpas. Uh, where we are working with our colleagues in the public works departments to evaluate those opportunities. And it's going to mean that we will be looking at trees and perhaps taking some steps to make broader updates to the street tree master plan. Those are items that will come before the commission. We wanted to use this opportunity to just do a, a little intro to the street tree master plan and designations, how it all came about. Uh, 
give us an opportunity to celebrate the diversity of tree species in Santa Barbara because it really is quite unique and very special and certainly answer any questions that you have. Uh, so with that, um, Mr. Downey's going to do the presentation and we'd entertain any questions you have and if not tonight, we'll have other meetings where we can talk about it as well. Thank you. Chair Clark and Commissioners, the Street Tree Master Plan was adopted by City Council in 1977. This is our current plan. Um, the plan is required by the Municipal Code, Chapter 1520. The uh, Municipal Code requires a systematic program uh, that uh, provides for the preservation, planting, and maintenance of street trees. The uh, designation portion of the list is utilized to assess tree planting options for various streets and segments and tree, uh, tree diversity in the community. At adoption, the street tree inventory listed 312 species of trees and the planting list that we uh, go off of to plant trees around the city was 77 species. Today, our tree inventory is over 450 species, and the designation list is 144 species. <clears throat> the designation portion matches tree species with whole streets or street segments. There are currently 1,185 segments. Um, the segments are based on the similarity of characteristics, like how wide is the parkway, is there overhead lines, and things like that. Um, managing the designation allows staff to uh, uh, provide change when it's needed and uh, allows for reasonable control of maintenance. As you can imagine, if we have a hodgepodge of trees in a segment of street, they might have differing maintenance requires requirements so having the same designated tree with similar maintenance as other trees in that uh, makes it easier to maintain uh, changes to the designation made by the parks and recreation Dir director with the approval of the parks and recreation commission which is your role uh, change requests are submitted for review uh, by the street tree advisory committee and the committee then makes recommendations uh, to the, the commission for those changes. Some reasons that changes become important. Uh, the tree is no longer commercially available. This tree in this photograph is a Morton Bay chestnut tree. It is one of four that we have in our inventory. Um, we uh, can't get this tree commercially. So when we got, want to plant a tree on the street that is designated Morton Bay Chestnut, we need to go through the process to change that designation because we can't get the tree. Another reason is if new pests or diseases come in, uh, this is uh, an oleander tree that has oleander leaf scorch. Um, if there's a disease that's widespread through a community uh, specific to certain trees like this particular one, it makes sense not to plant that species of tree and change it up so that the, the, the disease doesn't progress. The other is, uh, another reason is infrastructure conflicts. Um, when we have a designated tree and there's overhead power lines, uh, frequently we'll say, you know, maybe we should be changing that to a smaller species of tree that can exist under the line so that it doesn't have to be pruned so heavily. Another reason is the parkway size is too small for the tree. Um, the, the designated tree uh, eventually pushes the curb and sidewalk all over the place, and so it makes sense to plant a smaller tree. Sometimes, uh, as I just stated, the parkway is too small. The, uh, this particular tree on the left is taking up every inch of parkway, um, and, and it extends uh, 20 feet wide along the parkway so um, is it necessarily appropriate for the species to be in this size of parkway or should it be in a larger parkway so if the parkway is too small frequently we'll have uh, designation changes come to provide smaller trees that won't uh, disrupt the area also you have the situation on the right where you have a tree that is very small but doesn't provide enough benefits to the community we then will 
change just like earlier this evening we made a change to add canopy trees when a palm tree was designated this is another reason for change when there's a parkway is larger and can accommodate larger trees when there's new street improvements and maybe that segment of street doesn't have a designated tree we you see here we have an opportunity to plant a tree um, this particular section does have uh, a designation but uh, recent past we've had new streets come into the city uh, where we had to designate trees or uh, there were projects that opened up new space where there wasn't a designated tree um, that's when it would become uh, uh, important to make changes to the designation and increasing tree canopy the palm is a, a great tree but this parkway is much larger larger than that palm and it sure could use some canopy in this area like in the background of this photograph this whole process is, is something that we do to try and provide a great community resource and have canopy trees throughout the city. And with that, I would love to answer any questions that you have. I have one, and I, I should know the answer to this, so now I will. Um, I get asked quite often about why are these trees going here and who decided which ones they are and da 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 what are they. Um, our street got planted this year. <laughs> um, um, is there a website out there where I can just say, look up your street and you'll see what your designation is? Chair Clark and Commissioner McGill, um, at present we do not publish the street tree designation listing. Um, they can call the Parks Division office at 805-564-5433 or email myself or Mr. Slack uh, to get that information. Uh, my email is uh, t-d-o-w-n-e-y at Santa Barbara, C-A dot G-O-V. Um, we do, however, with our mapping system, show existing trees uh, on the mapping layer. So the city, the public is welcome to uh, go to uh, the city's website and uh, if they want to email me I'll send them a link uh, to the city's mapping system you can turn on the tree attribute and see what tree that is uh, that's existing out there on our city mapping I'll take one. I'll take the link <laughs> is, is there a reason why the street tree designations aren't published is it just a lack of time and resources uh, chair Clark and commissioners um, that's something that staff has had many discussions about. Uh, one of the reasons is that there are 1,185 segments. So that's a rather large document, one. S secondly, as you're aware, even tonight, we, we made three changes to that designation. So it is regularly updated. It averages about 10 times per year that we change that. Um, so um, it would cause staff to have to update that on the website every time there's a change. So we're struggling with uh, deciding whether we're going to publish that or not, and we haven't finished those discussions. There's, um, if, if you um, have a student in town and you want to know what school district you're at, you can go to the uh, Santa Barbara Unified School District website, and it looks like they just photocopied a page and they published it, and it's really rudimentary, but they just took a picture of their spreadsheet. I wonder if that would be. Chair Clark and commissioners, we certainly can put it on the city's website. That's not a problem. The only concern is remembering to update it and it becoming a workload thing. So as a, as a way of um, providing that information to the public, uh, we would likely post it and say last updated um, may not be, changes may have been made since. <laughs> and I would guess 99 times out of 100, it won't apply to somebody actually looking at that list because it may not be their change, but we wouldn't want them to rely solely on that as the be all and end all. Um, so we can certainly look into that. It's not super exciting to look at in its current format, so we'd also have to look at how to reformat it so it's a little bit more friendly to the public. It's essentially an Excel spreadsheet, which is not super easy to, to go through if you're not quite sure what you're looking for. 
but we can certainly do some investigation and report back to you. Chair Clark and Commissioners, there was one other thing that, that we struggle with. We get calls all the time about what's the designated tree uh, from landscape architects and whatnot, um, and we'll, we'll advise them at this time, this is what's designated, but at the end of your project, you should check again. The concern is somebody will go to the website and say, oh, this X, XYZ tree is designated, and then when they go to get their project approved, well, no, it's not. It's something different. So, so that's another complexity that we're, we're dealing with. Yeah, it's like when you think you're going to a movie that's been published in the paper, but you end up in the theater and no one's there. Like, yeah, same thing. Okay. Um, any more questions of Mr. Downey? Uh, we've come to our uh, director's report. So, Chair Clark and Commissioners, um, as usual, never a dull moment in Parks and Recreation. And summer's over. You have your fall activities guide. Uh, it's a preview. And um, we also mentioned in the director's report, free classes week, which is on the back. I encourage you to attend uh, any one of those classes. It's, it's a, at least for an adult, that is, or if you have children that would want to attend children's classes, please enjoy those. Um, we also have our annual Day of Caring, and that this year is on uh, September 14th. It's part of United Way, and the city's always an active participant. This year we have two locations, Skaters Point, Skate Park, will be repainted. It's high time, needs to happen. And then also work in the community garden at the East Side Neighborhood Park is on the list, something to do. And certainly you're more than welcome to join us. It's usually a morning of your time and you can sign up online. You can also let us know you're really interested in being there. It's, it's a good way to get outside and not be encumbered for a full day on a Saturday. And then um, just some other information for a number of years actually since 2013, time flies, we've been working with the Garden Club of Santa Barbara to look for opportunities to plant uh, new olive trees in Mission Historical Park. And the section of the park we're referring to is, bet is um, between APS and um, Mountain Drive. And it's where we have a lot of the historic mission buildings that are part of the, of the park today. Uh, Olive trees were first planted in this area, at least the earliest record is around 1891. But the Garden Club planted trees in 1919 to celebrate the end of World War I. Uh, they recently celebrated their centennial and as part of that, that um, celebration wanted to plant some new trees. Uh, trees don't last forever. Uh, we have the opportunity to plant some new trees which will help when some of the trees are, that are in greater decline might have to come out. And so we've been working with them. They recently uh, granted some funds to the city to purchase the trees, plant them. And then we're also uh, replacing the interpretive sign that's there that has been there for a very long time, probably about 12 or 13 years. And so it's time for a refresher. And we'll keep you posted on that project. I just wanted to comment that I, I picked this up at the Creo Rec Center and it, it felt like you put everything that's really exciting into it because I wanted to do everything. Um, and I was wondering, where can people get these besides the Creo Rec Center, the quick fall activities preview? Uh, Chair Clark and Commissioners, at any of our facilities, but they also get direct mailed. Oh, cool. um, so the idea is to try to reach as many people as possible mm -hmm. and, um, and then through promotion on our social media and website and that kind of activity. Great. Um, and my other, my one other comment was I'd be happy to help if you're putting flyers up for the day of caring. I wouldn't mind having a stack to put up different places if that's something you do. Okay. Sure, thank you. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Um, with that, we come to our youth watershed education update. So Chair Clark and Commissioners, we have Liz Smith, who's the Creeks Outreach Coordinator, and she's been the Outreach Coordinator now. I remember when Liz came on board and then she transitioned into this position 10 years ago. Wow, 
pretty impressive. Mm -hmm. uh, it's been a while since she was before the commission. There was a request from the chair to hear about what they're doing for youth watershed education. It's mm -hmm. a key component of what the Creeks Division mm -hmm. um, strives to do, educate the next generation, and um, also give you an opportunity for new commissioners to meet Liz. Thank you. Welcome. Good evening, everyone. Um, like Jill said, I'm Liz Smith. I'm the Creeks Outreach Coordinator, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about our youth watershed education programs. So I wanted to give you just a quick overview of uh, big picture, the education and outreach efforts that we are working on throughout the year. So we have lots of advertising. We participate in community events. We are active on social media and online. Lots of volunteer events. I was at a beach cleanup today. Um, we do outreach around our different restoration projects and ongoing programs. And then we have our community-based outreach programs which are targeting specific pollutants, like our Close the Poop Loop campaign around pet waste. And we're just kicking off Our Water, Our World, which is related to pesticide use. Um, but of course, today we're here to talk about our youth watershed education. So we have a goal to reach 3,000 school-aged children each year. And this goal is built into the city's stormwater management program, which we also refer to as the SWIMP or the state permit. That's our uh, permit through the State Water Resources Control Board. It's also built into our public education plan, and it's one of our performance measures in the city's P3 program. We, uh, most of our outreach to youth is conducted through a contract with Explore Ecology. This contract provides free programs to schools in the city of Santa Barbara. We have a Creek Kids series that includes in-class presentations, field trips to local creeks, and field trips to the Watershed Resource Center at Arroyo Borough Beach. And because this is a voluntary program and it's based on teacher interest and availability, if um, a teacher doesn't have the time, the class time to commit to the whole series, um, Explore Ecology can definitely provide standalone lessons and field trips. And Explore Ecology also um, are available for additional presentations and events as needed when we ask them. So that's also built into our contract. Explore Ecology's curriculum is aligned with state standards and is also grade and age appropriate. And also built into our contract is administration of the Watershed Resource Center at Arroyo Borough Beach. And those costs are shared with County Project Clean Water. And the WRC, the Watershed Resource Center, provides a meeting space for community groups. They're open to the community every weekend. And they also host beach cleanups one weekend a month. And hopefully this will work. I've got a short video that Explore Ecology produced. <laughs> Okay, so in addition to Explore Ecology programs, the Creeks Division staff are always available to provide presentations and project tours upon request. And in recent years, we've provided field trips and presentations to local schools. We coordinate with Parks and Recreation's Nature Camp when we can. It's been a couple of years since we've gotten in there with Nature Camp, but we hope to do it again soon. We work with service clubs, scout troops, any youth organization that wants to uh, come visit one of our projects or do a service event, we're happy to help them out. Our volunteer opportunities include native plantings, creek and beach cleanups, and storm drain marking. 
We also work on having uh, youth-friendly activities and outreach materials available at community events like the Earth Day Festival. Um, we participate in Looking Good Santa Barbara and various community events throughout the year. And pardon me. Sorry, excuse me. And I wanted to invite you to our biggest event of the year coming up in a couple weeks is Creek Week. And this is our 20th year. Um, we're inviting the community to check out sbcreekweek.com or facebook.com slash sbcreekweek. I've highlighted a few of the events that the Creeks Division is hosting or co-hosting. We'll have our Land Shark Tour. We'll have a tour of Arroyo Burro at Barger Canyon. We will have an open space planting at the Arroyo Burro Open Space. Uh, and that's co-hosted with the Barchin Group, a local real estate group. And then we'll also be hosting a movie night along with Explore Ecology and County Project Clean Water at the Watershed Resource Center out in the park. So folks can bring a picnic and a blanket and come see a movie with us. And I've passed out our postcards. You can see the image on the right. And this year we are hosting a coloring contest. So if uh, folks want to color in the poster, the postcard, and share it online, we'll have some fun prizes coming up. So with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. We also have Lindsay Johnson, the executive director, and Jenny Davis, the education coordinator from Explore Ecology here tonight. Will Creek Man be making an appearance during Creek Week? <laughs> I'm not sure. I have to get uh, someone into the costume. <laughs> I, <haven't. laughs> I, I'm always just so thrilled with what you guys do during Earth Day. Your booths are so captivating, and I've organized events with you before, and your department makes it really easy for the youth to get involved in a service way with our with our watershed resources. So thank you for that. Does anybody have? Yeah, it's just great. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I think what you're doing for our community is invaluable. I mean, my kids know so much about our watershed because of our Creek Department and what they've done with Explore Ecology. Thank you. Did, that's it? Any media we want to color this in? Sure, your choice. <laughs> okay. It's also available on the website in a full sheet coloring page, so if cool. you prefer that. Um, thank you. I believe that we have any old business or new business, so we just have an adjournment. So with that, I'll adjourn this meeting. Thanks.